So I wanted to talk a bit about the incursion onto Swan Island military base, which occurred um, almost exactly two weeks ago, Thursday, the 2nd of October, um, which I participated in along with seven other activists. We infiltrated Swan Island, which is um, one of the most clandestine defence and intelligence facilities in the country. Notoriously, it is often said that less is known about what goes on at Swan Island than is known about what goes on at Pine Gap, which is famously this kind of super secret facility, but is much more well known. Um, essentially, it's a military base on an island. It's run by um, a combination of the ADF and ACES. I'll talk more about the nature of Swan Island in a bit. But yeah, eight of us um, got onto it. And um, the whole experience was a bit of a clusterfuck. Uh, you know, and I've sort of been wanting to, uh, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about what happened and wanting to talk it through. Um, and I've kind of been incubating this monologue for about two weeks. <laughs> and I was going to do it today, knock it off, get it done. Unfortunately, I received a call this morning at 4.30am from the notorious breeze like Puff Mellow in Kathmandu and then had terrible trouble getting back to sleep. So I didn't get the jump on the day that I had really hoped to, but now the light is fading and I've got a thing to get to. So I don't know if I'm going to get through the whole rant. It's going to be a discursive rant. I've got I'm not even sure where to look. I've never done one of these before, amazingly. I talked to my phone a bit on the ground at Actions, but I've never really sat and delivered a monologue to camera, to a webcam. I don't have much experience doing this. I'm sort of thinking, should I look at myself here? Should I look at the camera so it's like I'm talking to you? Hello, hello, internet. Um, and I've got my notes over here. I guess I'll just kind of wing it. We'll see how we go. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've got a thing to get to. So I'm, I was going to hopefully do this in a kind of marathon stint, but in, in practice, no, we'll do it in bits. Um, and yeah, the whole thing was um, full on and I've had a lot of thoughts about it, um, which I've tried to sort of structure, but, you know, this is going to be a somewhat discursive ramble, so bear with me. Um, or don't. See if I care. <laughs> um... But ideally do, I don't know, do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> um, where was I? Beating through the bush on Swan Island, there were, yeah, two teams of four. My team of four um, were the second to get onto the island at about 4.30 a.m. I can't talk too much about how we actually got onto the island because hilariously it would appear that they don't actually know yet. Um, last we heard, they were still a bit in the dark about how we actually got onto this island. It's, it's you know, off the coast of a little picturesque seaside town called Queenscliff on the Bellerin Peninsula, accessible only by a very narrow traffic bridge, um, which, you know, it's the practice of Swan Island Peace Convergence to blockade for a number of days. Um, and we were heading for the northern kind of business end of the island. Not much is known about the terrain of Swan Island, but we know enough to know that, you know, the bottom half of it, it's quite a large island, um, is basically just bushland wilderness. Um, and the, the sort of, it's in the northern part that there's sort of buildings and infrastructure. And so that's what we're headed towards. And we were on there for three and a half hours, you know, beating through the bush. Um, strange things go through your head. I was thinking a lot about what I was going, you know, why I was doing it. <laughs> Um, and more specifically, what I was going to tell people um, about why, why I did it, you know. Um, <laughs> I'll get to that in a second. But, you know, it was surprisingly easy, frankly. It was, it, 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 you know, so it seemed initially it was a cakewalk, as much of a, a cakewalk as, as infiltrating one of the most clandestine defence facilities in the country is ever going to be. Simon Moyle, who was part of my team, the Reverend Simon Moyle, who's a Baptist minister, um, certainly one of the, well, if not the most kick-ass Baptist minister that I've ever known, 
back in the Occupy day, we used to there was a running gag about how, how he was kind of occupying Melbourne's answer to Harvey, Harvey Keitel in From Dust Till Dawn, striding around, shooting vampires, shooting zombies, I should say, non-violently, of course, um, with a crossbow made from a crucifix or some shit, legendary figure, was joking that it was a bit like a, you know, it was just a nice walk in the bush. It was fairly heavy scrub, we were beating through the, you know, undergrowth. It was the closest I've ever been to being in Nam, and the closest I hope I ever will be. You know, this terrain that had clearly been used, evidently had been used for military training exercises. Um, you know, and sort of dropping to the ground and freezing every time we heard the slightest sound, um, and so on. But yeah, three hours we were doing this. Um, but Moyle said, yeah, you know, it's just a walk in the bush, good company for the moment, you know, good company. Um, but there was also an element of tension naturally that made it somewhat more interesting than the average bushwalk. Um, but it all seemed pretty easy, you know, almost too easy right up until the very end. Uh, when it became apparent that the other group of four, the group that I was not in, uh, were, as fate would have it, not apprehended by the police, um, as we were lucky enough to be, some of the <laughs> nicest cops in the world, I think, because they were kind of appalled by what they had just seen. Um, the other group of four were apprehended by soldiers who are believed to be members of the SAS, who were overheard being referred to by police as members of the SAS, and they were tortured. They were subjected to treatment which was most certainly in gross violation of Australian law. And according to a number of legally qualified people, probably UN conventions against torture to boot. So, yeah, that happened. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, in the end, as a, as a kind of journey into the heart of darkness, as it turns out, we got our, our money's worth, some of us more than others. Um, yeah, and the, the, the question I suppose that I keep coming back to or that I was coming back to as I was striding through the bush thinking, you know, yeah, what, what am I going to say about why I did this? Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's an area that I feel that I'm a bit deficient in as an activist when I do these things. I always have a good understanding um, in my heart of why I'm participating in an action and a reasonably good understanding on an intellectual level of why I'm doing it as well. But I'm, I guess in terms of, of um, articulating it to other people, I'm lazy just because there's always the convenience of a, a Greg Rolls or whoever who's around who can, who can do that more effectively than I can. So I'm quite happy to leave it to them. But, you know, I think that's a cop out. You know, if, you, if you're going to do these things, obviously you're going to be asked why you did it. Um, and you have a bit of an obligation to be able to give a convincing and, and reasonably articulate answer for yourself. Um, so I was thinking about what I was going to say to the media, if they asked, what I was going to say in court. Um, and what I was going to say to friends, and you know, funny things go through your head when you're beating through the bush, <laughs> doing what we were doing. I thought what I might say was that, uh, you know, it occurred to me that a lot of the things that are wrong with me as a person, you know, some people wouldn't believe, most of my friends would swear blind, there's nothing wrong with me as a person. Um, but they don't, they don't really know, they don't know me. You think you know me, you don't. Um, a lot of the things that are wrong with me as a person could be fixed or at least improved by being more like my hero, Sean Bedlam, um, as he's no doubt told you, whoever you are, Nada, in New York, if you're watching this, he's probably called you up to tell you this, even though he doesn't know you. I'm obsessed with that guy. I stalk him everywhere he goes. I've even threatened his girlfriend. Just kidding, all of that is complete bullshit. I've never done any of those things. Um, except for the part about how he's probably told me that that's true because he's an egomaniacal, delusional fruit loop. Um, 
Yeah, more like Chong Bedlam. So I thought what I'd do is, you know, some kind of reasonably hardcore, but basically fairly safe, or so we thought at the time, um, act of non-violent direct action, and then record a highly narcissistic, self-indulgent piece to camera in a lame attempt to impress everybody with how funny I am and how insightful I am. So, Bedbug, Uncle Betty, this one's for you, you piece of shit. Um, just kidding. You know I love you, Beto. Well, possibly actually you don't know that, <laughs> as if you're watching this anyway. Um, but I do, I do. It's not your fault that you have, that you're deeply insecure and have anger management issues and mental problems. Anyway, where was I? <laughs> Swan Island, let's talk about Swan Island. Um, it's a large military facility on an island, you know, off the coast of Victoria, run partly by the IDF and partly by ISIS, and it's very secretive. Um, it's often said, as I said, that less is known about what goes on at Swan Island than is known about what goes on at Pine Gap. Um, there's a good report by a group called the Nautilus Institute, which is online, Richard Tranter and so on, um, which is probably the most comprehensive public account um, of you know, what Swan Island is known to be used for and, and what it's speculated to be used for. We do know that it's used to train members of the SAS, the elitist of the elite special forces troops. Um, there was a report by Fairfax a few years back, which has never been denied, of course, that um, that includes a, a group of SAS known as the Four Squadron or Squadron Four, who undertake what are called capture and kill intelligence missions, doing a fairly severely brutal type of espionage work, including it's alleged in countries in Africa where we have no acknowledged military engagement, all of which is fairly severely questionable in terms of international law. And it's used heavily by ASIS to train more conventional overseas spies and as a communication centre and for various other things, many of which are varying degrees of mysterious to totally unknown because when they say Australian secret intelligence service, they're not really kidding about that. I mean, that whole Sheraton Hotel training incident fiasco in 1983 um, aside, which admittedly was pretty hilarious, if you don't know about that, I really encourage you to read up on that little incident. Um, and obviously there's sort of this element of Australian government, we've got a secret that's kind of geared towards trying to psych people out, but it's reasonable to assume that fundamentally they're fairly fucking serious about that whole secrecy thing. Um, so that brings us to Swan Island Peace Convergence. Basically that's become an annual event which is organised by a group of predominantly Christian peace and social justice activists, social peace, Christian peace and social justice activists, some of whom would identify as anarcho-Christians, certainly not everyone they would identify as an anarchist far from it and these days certainly not everyone involved would identify as a Christian but that's the kind of tendency it's coming from and that's been a, a subject of, of, of some interest to me as someone who, I, you know, I don't know a whole lot of and have never known a whole lot of devout people who identify as devout Christians by choice frankly um, <laughs> But, you know, one would imagine that, generally speaking, devout Christians are a bit um, antipathetic towards anarchism. <laughs> and I have known a fair number of people who identify as anarchists, and I can confidently say that an awful lot of them are extremely suspicious of, if not outright antipathetic and hostile towards Christianity and institutional religion generally. So it's an interesting intersection, especially since these anarcho-Christian people um, I'd have to say are some of the, certainly some of the best Christians I've ever known, which wouldn't be particularly hard, because I don't know many of them, and they're also some of the best anarchists that I know, but that's a whole side road, we're getting distracted. 
I said it would be rambling and discursive, but we've got to put boundaries somewhere. Um, just looking, oh my God, I need a haircut. <laughs> anyway, narcissism. <laughs> Swan Island Peace Convergence basically consists of a blockade at the gate of Swan Island, which is, you know, it's accessible yet yeah, only by this single very long narrow traffic bridge um, with a massive gate in front of it. Um, so in terms of restricting access to it, it's pretty easy. You just sit in front of the gate and, you know, traffic can't get through unless it wants to run you over. Um, you know, and the blockade goes for several days with the objective essentially of, you know, of trying to shut down the base, but with the larger goal of trying to draw attention to the existence of this place, which, you know, is not well known and not um, particularly acknowledged, I mean they acknowledge it exists obviously, but they don't talk a lot about it or what goes on there. Um, and through that issues arising out of Australia's ongoing involvement in the war in Afghanistan, that was kind of, I believe, the impetus for the whole thing. Um, and the US military alliance generally, and the function of, of the wars that we, you know, the Australian military is involved in via that. Um, and militarism and war generally. Um, the first one was in 2010, that was relatively small and ad hoc. I think two activists, um, Jess Morrison and Simon Moyle, the aforementioned, got deep inside the base and actually shut off a satellite dish um, and then proceeded to try and blockade the gate. Um, there were subsequent blockades in 2011 and 2012, um, which were um, the first, the the first one in 2011 was ultimately unsuccessful, the one in 2012 was more successful, but in both cases there was a very aggressive effort by police to prevent you know, the blockade, to, to break the blockade, to drag people away and arrest them. Um, and this was an own goal for the powers that be at Swan Island because of course what they really want and what they really like is for there to be very little attention paid to this thing and not for there to be footage on the news of activists being roughed up by police and dragged around and so on, which there was as a result um, of the 2011 and 2012 peace convergences. So last year, which was the first um, Swan Island that I had been to, recommended or you know referred by a number of friends who you know, were involved in this thing previously. Um, the police presence was much reduced, dramatically reduced, and they were obviously taking a very hands-off approach. So hands-off in the end, you know, with the objective that this would result in less attention being paid to the thing, they kind of overshot the mark in that they left the front gate unlocked, um, which was realised, you know, <laughs> And so on the final day of the blockade, very early in the morning, a bunch of people posed, you know, a bunch of us posed, I wasn't there, unfortunately, <laughs> due to other story, um, in front of the gate for a photo op with a banner. And then one person just quietly lifted up the latch, you know, the bolt on the ground, pushed open the gate and 18 people piss bolted through the gate across the bridge. And there were like four cops there. Um, who of course were vastly outnumbered and you can see on YouTube there's this incredible footage of these people marching across the bridge onward Christian soldiers, not, nothing's going to stop them, you know, except these four cops who tried desperately to pull people back and I think did pull back three people. The remaining 15 got over the bridge, got under a second fence across the bridge um, and ultimately planted a vine and a fig tree as was their intention, which is a symbolic thing. Um, it's a verse from, I think, Matthew about turning swords into plowshares. Um, before eventually being, you know, reinforcements came, they were rounded up and ejected from the base and they all got off ultimately with no penalty. They were charged with Commonwealth trespass and gave these kick-ass sentencing statements, you know, in a courtroom and the judge said, fair enough, fair fuck enough and let them off. <laughs> so the whole thing had this sort of, t sort of tone of miraculousness about it. Um, it was really impressive, um, you know, and possibly that induced somewhat of a false sense of security in us the following year where they had taken that strategy of hands off to the very next level and that, you know, there was no police presence, there was no security there, there was, you know, and, and the point is that we had won, we'd shut the base down last year, they had 
put the base on stand down and we were told that from the minute we arrived you know for these three days basically effectively you, you have shut the base down simply by being here we're not going to even try to get traffic through they did try to get a few vehicles through last year unsuccessfully and this year I think there were two there was like a, a, a hygiene contractor and a laundry contractor or some you know some people hadn't got the memo and got turned away sorry the base is, is closed um, <clears throat> you know and there was like one cop car parked halfway up the road occasionally they sort of came down and, and did sort of foot patrols in groups of two but that was it you know um, and there was a very funny comment that was made by Jess Morrison who's one of the organizers of this thing to Nicola Paris who's another very experienced activist who was with us this year um, <laughs> and Nick said that Jess had told her that turn the other cheek is like the Christian equivalent of saying game on bitches Nick Paris added the bitches and she was careful to note that but what was the point oh yeah basically that they had turned the other cheek on us you know, this, this was my sort of just thinking about you know they had effectively won they had taken the wind out of our sails by just rolling over completely shutting the base leaving us alone just letting us sit there at the gate getting bored frankly and um yeah and so yeah they turned the other cheek it was game on we had to up the ante in some way we had to do an incursion and it had to be an unprecedented occasion incursion so an unprecedented incursion so in the very early hours of the final day of the blockade on the first day eight of us got onto the island and and, and went deep in there and were not discovered um for three and a half hours um yeah so that's that part done i suppose that, yeah, i wanted to talk a bit about why again why was i there it's one i was huge just hugely impressed when i went last year by how well organized and well executed the whole thing was you know when i say well organized it was also organized in a very horizontal non-hierarchical um you know prefigurative politicsy kind of way um you know and but you know it was kind of the anarchist equivalent of a military operation um i was really impressed by the commitment of the people involved to the values they were espousing i mean not only that they were extremely knowledgeable and extremely well educated about you know what they were you know the issues that they were there you know for but also really committed in their hearts to to these values of peace and justice that they were espousing which you know appealed a lot to me having become quite jaded about um a lot of activism you know and activists a lot of whom run around talking a lot about how they want a better world whilst treating each other like crap which seems fairly self-defeating to me these people were not like that um are not like that um you know they walk the talk <laughs> to coin a phrase um but yeah this year there was a, a bit of a sense that it was kind of game over they'd got us figured out they knew what they had to do which was just let us have the gates and leave us alone um and we had to up the ante so we did but even then it was sort of like having having been cursed on the base we were like you know well yeah okay so we did this um and now we're going to get arrested and and kicked out and so what which was disappointing to me you know um You know, which was disappointing to me because it, it seemed to me, you know, the whole thing was sort of, you know, I'm just, I'm jumping around. I've jumped forward to a bit that I was going to do later. <coughs> um, there are a lot of things happening at the time that are still happening at the moment, but literally were happening the week of the convergence and on the days of the blockade. Look at my hair. Ah. <laughs> um literally the week of the convergence and on the days of the blockade and the incursion which seemed to me like the whole thing was kind of the perfect Swan Island storm given it had been this huge success last year that had made national news and and had been a hugely positive experience for the people involved 
um, and given the political climate, um, it was like the perfect Swan Island storm. And I, I was surprised and a bit disappointed by the lack of interest and buzz around this thing. There were actually fewer people there than last year. I don't know why, partly because the organisers are all extremely busy and distracted by other things and it was maybe under promoted. But um, I, for one, was really happy to be there at such a time. There was absolutely nowhere else I would rather have been. Um, you know, and then I was going to talk a bit about like the value of, of doing direct action um, you know, and going out there on the ground and fucking shit up directly, which is just a thing that I think is enormously important and valuable to do. Um, who knows if it really makes a difference in a lot of cases, if it really changes anything, but it is at least a cathartic thing to do and hopefully inspires others. Because if people, you know, who are doing these kinds of things, you know, if people were doing these things in really large numbers, um, they, whoever they are, these poor bastards, Grant Morrison, 2000, would have a really serious problem on their hands. <clears throat> um, yeah, there are a number of issues which seem to make it a timely action. Um, so I could talk about that. I don't know, yeah, I'm, I'm now finding myself split two ways because I was going to go back. And yeah, one of my shortcomings, one of my shortcomings as an activist is I'm not very good at articulating, or at least that I'm lazy about it. You know, for someone who's supposedly reasonably articulate, I'm quite happy to defer to someone else to actually talk about why. You know, the night before, we were all, you know, you know, after we'd had our sort of secret squirrel meeting, you know nailing out the final logistics of this thing. Um, we were asked for media purposes each to give a one-line explanation of why we'd done it. I was going to say I thought it would just make for a really good hey gag on Twitter, which uh, I actually did deliver on Twitter from deep within the base, which went over well with the Twitterati, as one might have predicted. <laughs> hey, Asio, guess where I am? No, seriously, guess where I am? Um, in the end, I opted for this Chomsky line that we all know about. If you want to stop terrorism, there's a really easy way, and that is to stop participating in it. Um, but, you know, that's very sound body. But that is a line that I kept coming back to. Again, yeah, traipsing through the undergrowth, thinking about, you know, how, you know, what am I going to say? Why? Why am I doing Why are you doing it, Tegan? Why did you do it? You know, this line about, I think it's, that it's important to disrupt the war machine by any means possible. And, you know, I do think that. But at the same time, being conscious that, you know, that's a sentiment that would be considered a very extreme sort of statement by a lot of people who would say, well, you know, don't we need war machines? You know, sometimes don't we need an army? Um, you know, some of whom, these people who might say that might go so far as to question the value of particular military actions that the government takes, you know, in our name. Um, but would say, well, you know, geopolitics, it's, it's a complex business and we have to trust ultimately that our leaders know what they're doing and are, you know, going to do basically the right thing and the best thing, or at least something approximating and we have to trust them. Um, which led me to what I think would be a, a considerably less controversial or, or, or um, contentious point, which is that, you know, we manifestly can't trust the government. Um, you know, to do what's in the interest, you know, like I would say governments generally, but certainly I think a lot of people would be inclined to agree that this current Australian government in particular, we can't trust it to do what's in the interests of the vast majority of ordinary people, even when it's in the wide open, you know, let alone, you know, you know, I mean, it's hard to know where to start with that. I think it's a point a lot of people could probably get behind if they're honest, you know, let alone when they're operating, you know, yeah, that they can't be trusted to do the right thing when they're in the wide open, let alone operating in the dark without much or any scrutiny and just saying, well, you know, you'll have to trust us. Um, so, yeah, and what are those things? What are those things? Basically, there's sort of three really... Um, deeply interconnected issues that were just very much um, on the, you know, in the spotlight at that particular time. 
It was formally announced on the day of the incursion, or I think the day after, that Australia is predictably very much on board the latest US sort of military expedition attack, whatever you want to call it, on Iraq. We're, you know, we're bombing, we're sending SAS troops. Um, you know, because the last war on Iraq, this isn't a war, this, don't call it a war, it's a mission. It's a war ad. It's a oracle. I had the, I had Lenny Golightly, who's staying with me at the moment, in his inimitable German fashion, dancing around my living room the other day, going, "It's a oracle. It's a oracle. Um, it's a oracle." You know, it'll take a couple of weeks. You know, um, the last war in Iraq. Not that this is a war. Was such an incredible success, such an overwhelming success that has brought so much joy and prosperity to. Dick Cheney, if absolutely nobody else or very few other people, even good old John Howard, bless his socks. I'm thinking I should look into the camera. I don't know. Like, how do we do this? The lights just changed, indicating that the sun's gone down. I'm mindful that I've got to go to Max's birthday drinks quite soon. And I was going to cut this off, but I seem to be on a roll, so I'm going to keep going. Um, yeah. I want people to understand that I'm not reading off notes here. I'm looking at myself. <laughs> you know, I've got my notes over here, but I'm only glancing at those. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, war in Iraq. <laughs> um, even good old John Howard. You, you, you know, bless his socks. You know things are seriously fucked when you find yourself feeling sort of vaguely nostalgic about the Howard era. Um, signs things are seriously fucked. <laughs> Um, he recently confessed in, you know, and this was reported by various media that he was quite embarrassed, unquote, about the fact that we, in the words of Iraq veterans against the wars, Vince Emanuele, who would know because he was there, did two tours, killed a number of people and so on, saw the sights. We've completely devastated that country, <laughs> essentially or ostensibly on the basis of intelligence assessments that we all now know, you know, about the Iraqi government having we weapons of mass destruction and so on. We all now know we're completely and totally false. John Howard, even John Howard was embarrassed about that, embarrassing lol orcs. Um, and now for some really mysterious reason, it turns out that it's more filled than ever with fanatical head-lopping militants who hate us for our freedom, or hate us for some reason, you know. And so the only logical course of action, obviously, is to bomb it and attack it even more. Obviously, what could possibly go wrong? Yeah, and perhaps not uncoincidentally, point number two, a few weeks earlier, the official terror alert level was raised for the first time since this system of terror alert levels was instituted in 2003. It was raised to the second highest level of high. Um, you know, there's four levels. The highest means that a terror attack is imminent or has already occurred. This just means that one's likely. And this was done for no specific particular stated reason. Although, of course, there's this vague suggestion they can fall on, back on that there might be a reason, um, which, of course, no one's going to comment on. Um, but, of course, the facts are that there basically has never been a real terrorist attack on Australian soil since 1978. In real terms, the real threat to public safety in Australia from, from terrorism is less than that of being struck by lightning. Literally, you know, war, war and lightning, war and bathtub falls, which also kill many, many more people in Australia than terrorism. Um, but unlike, say, bathtubs, terrorism, of course, terrorism, just the word, <laughs> is a thing that people find really scary. And, of course, there's naturally enormous political capital and mileage in scary-seeming things. So raised terror alert level and this was then backed up and sort of justified 
justified by various ridiculous shenanigans, including this laughable raid on 25 properties involving 800, count them, 800 police and probably even more media personnel than that, you know, leading ultimately to charges being laid, I think, against one person, a 22-year-old who it transpired had said something to someone on the phone about maybe randomly beheading someone and who was damningly found to actually be in possession of a fake plastic sword. Um, and, you know, I mean, one has to lull, but the reality is that this has been highly effective. It's been extremely effective in creating a kind of mass fear and loathing climate amongst the populace, you know, this sort of synthetic terror um, memorably described by Glenn Greenwald as an increasingly unhinged fear-mongering orgy of synthetic terror because, you know, there's one thing <laughs> that you can bank on politically in Australia, it's that not to put too fine a point on it, it's filled with xenophobes and outright racists and this has precipitated numerous random attacks on Muslims and so on and generally made people perversely feel much less safe and be much less safe. Which some people might say is a fairly despicable and irresponsible thing for a government to be doing extremely transparently, you could almost say admirably transparently for pure propaganda reasons but which some might say is an entirely predictable thing for a government and certainly for this government to be doing, but which in any case I and a lot of people found to be fairly profoundly unedifying and sickening. You know, and to finish the point I was making earlier about direct action, I mean, one thing I found, I don't know if it's effective politically in precipitating change a lot of the time. I mean, you know, functional... Um, blockades and things sometimes can actually make change. We've seen this, you know, in various blockades against coal seam gas mining and things like that in the sphere of environmental activism. You know, it, it does sometimes actually make things happen. But, you know, it's also just really satisfying, you know, to, to go out there and put your body on the line and say on a personal level, you know, I dissent to this, um, you know, I'm not just passively going along with this. Um, this is not okay, you know, in a really physical and direct way. So that was, you know, that was something that was very foremost in my mind, well, not foremost, but was high in my mind, you know, that for me personally, it was just about saying, fuck you in response to all of that. Um, like seriously, fuck you. Um, and the third kind of thing that was in the air is, is the first of, of the three trenches that keep using this word trenches. I don't really know what a trench is, but if, if, if these are what trenches are, I think it's safe to say I'm not a fan of them. Um, new trenches of, of national security laws, which are, as I understand it, or will be, in many ways, the most extreme national security laws of any country comparable to Australia. The first tranche passed the Senate that week when we were there um, and subsequently sailed also through the House of Reps as it was guaranteed to do um, with the full support of the opposition in our wonderful oppositional two-party system of government that we have. Um, you know, this is, you know, as a result of this, journalists or whistleblowers, you know, can go to jail for five to ten years, completely regardless, you know, for, for blowing the whistle and doing the job of journalism, reporting on what's going on, what the government is doing, you know, totally regardless of whether or not their disclosure might have been in the public interest. There's no public interest. Um, get out clause. Um, you know, if we're talking about what's classed by Asia as a special operation and they don't have to have any particular criteria for designating something as a special operation, it seems to be the case that generally a special operation 
is classed as a special operation if it means that they're going to break the law because one of the other features of a special operation is that ASIO agents and their friends now have immunity from prosecution if they're engaged on a special operation um, regardless of what they do which someone, it might have been Leslie O'Shea, was observing now formally enshrines in law the idea that there are two classes of people in Australia, the vast majority of people who at least on paper are required to follow the law and a much smaller group of people who aren't. Um, and unprecedented powers to spy on people and mess around with the contents of their computers. This, you know, in a post-Snowden climate where people supposedly should be a bit concerned about the extent to which that's going on already, they're going to give themselves more powers to do it. Um, to potentially surveil the entire internet, seriously to surveil the entire internet with a single warrant because it's a computer network and so on. Um, and that's just for starters, that's tranche one, which is now law. Um, there's more to come. Um, but you know, with all of this, they're essentially writing themselves this terrifyingly enormous blank check on the back of this line of trust us where the government so obviously you can rely on us to act in your best interest. We're not going to abuse this in any way, you know, obviously. Um, which is a line of reasoning that apparently, and to me kind of intriguingly, uh, a large proportion of people are seemingly more or less happy to accept for some reason. Um, you know. So I'm back. I was gonna, I, yeah, I cut it at that point and I was sort of thinking I was gonna leave it for the evening and just, you know, go to Max's birthday. But, uh, you know, I seem to be kind of on a bit of a roll. Um, and it probably, it seems good to just push on through. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, the next bit is a bit of a leap sideways, um, from where we were at. But, you know, what I was, I was sort of gonna be like, well, you've gotten this far. You, you've yawned through me trotting out the media talking points. So now I'll, I'll, I'll level with you and tell you the real reason, the real reason why I did it. Um, you know, <laughs> again, I come back to this thing of, yeah, <laughs> bashing through the bush on Swan Island, strange things go through your head. What was in that woodshed? Will death be gentle? It's kind of funny, the things you think at times like these. Why did I do it? Well, there was this person who was also part of the Swan Island kind of community who I had met when I went to Swan Island last year. Um, you know, who's, yeah. Um, and had had, you know, various minor dealings with in the interim. There was a, a vigil held outside DEAC, formerly DEAC, formerly, formerly the Department of Immigration and Citizenship now the Department of Immigration and Border Control um, in response to the death of Reza Barati on Manus Island, all of that, an attempt to occupy outside DEAC, which held for, you know, about two weeks, which I was involved in, the Canberra Peace Convergence in April, which was a, a related event to the Swan Island Peace Convergence. But you, people always say, why, you know, why do you target the ADF? Why don't you target the politicians? Why don't you go after the politicians? All right, we'll do that. Also, um, you know, we're staying at the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. That was fairly awesome. Um, you know. But I've been thinking about this person and it had sort of gradually dawned on me that they were kind of hauntingly similar in certain ways to a person I used to know who I was fairly close to and who had been very mean, had then subsequently been very mean to me. Um, and I had a dream about the two of them, you know, this Swan Island person and this other person in which they had kind of been conflated into one person and that dream haunted me. So I'd been thinking a bit about this person and, um, you know, who's a perfectly nice person, you know, someone I would very much like to be friends with since they sort of have the quality that I look for in, in people that I like to associate with of being simultaneously very, you know, conscientious and also very sharp and also very strong-willed, which I think is a, a winning 
personality combination people that I would like to be friends with. Um, but it became apparent to me from the minute that I arrived at SIPC 14, you know, sort of walked in the door into the sort of large living area of the guest house where we were all staying and, and this person said hello to me. I had this sort of sinking realization of, oh shit, we've become afraid of this person, you know, because I had this sort of anxiety reaction when they said hello to me, you know, which is a, an issue that I have. And in terms of talking about all of this stuff, I, you know, I questioned whether I should even talk about it um, for various reasons, not least because it seems pretty frivolous in light of all the other stuff. And I don't know if it'll play as being particularly connected to the other stuff, although in a relatively maybe esoteric way, um, which relates to preoccupations that I have around interpersonal anxiety and, and people being afraid of other people, <laughs> often for extremely stupid and circular and nonsensical reasons, which is a phenomenon that I think on a, on a kind of global scale on both macro and micro levels has an awful lot to answer for, you know, and there was a sort of bit of a rant I was going to do just about politics in general and why I have difficulty talking about my reasons for doing this because I'm just sick of politics. I've been, you know, ever since I got on the whole Occupy train in 2011, you know, which is three years ago, almost to the day now. Um, I've been heavily immersed in all kinds of politics. And one of the very draining things about all of that is just having to constantly stick your head in the toilet of how horrendously fucked things are. You know, and like I've very effectively just diverted off onto a whole other rant, which I'm not sure is even particularly relevant, except to say that according to the definition of politics, the word politics that I like, which is that, you know, a very broad definition politics is, is essentially social relations concerning authority or power, which is a lot of the social relations, um, you know, in a very interesting and important arena of social relations. To, to say that you're sick of politics is sort of to say you're kind of sick of life. And maybe I am, maybe I'm sick of life. <laughs> um, but that's sort of how I'm feeling at the moment. How did I get onto that? Yeah, um, interpersonal anxiety and people being afraid of other people often for extremely stupid and circular reasons, which is a phenomenon that I think on a global scale, you know, as above, so below, has an awful lot to answer for um, in terms of the humans and the problems that they have, which are considerable. Um, you know, uh, yeah, so it was, it was just shitful to me to realise that I had arrived at this thing and that I, was af that I was afraid of this person, that I had developed this sort of terror of this person, in fact, for no rational reason at all, because they seemed to be perfectly nice um, and, and harmless. Um, well, harmless to me anyway, you know, possibly not harmless to other people, but... <laughs> um, you know, so I, I resolved that we needed to sort of nip this tendency in the bud because at an event like Swan Island, you know, it's really important and the, the bedrock of this thing is a sense of solidarity and, and sort of and trust and goodwill between people and not alienation and, and, and mistrust between the participants. It's crucial, you know, especially if you're going to be doing sort of like fairly... Um, risky things together, um, you know, and there had been elements, unrelated elements at, at, the, yeah, at, the, at the camera piece convergence, which were, you know, which really marred the event. I mean, I, fortunately those were kept under wraps. I'm not going to talk too much about that. And it didn't mar the event in a big way, but there were elements of alienation occurring between various participants, which were pretty stupid and pretty juvenile. Um, and really regrettable because you know they created this bad this bad vibe for for the people who were at least sort of involved in that. And just I'm sick of shit like that. I'm really sick of it. Um, you know why can't we all just get along, etc. So I was often nip this in the bud um, because I do have this issue sometimes with becoming afraid of people and developing a sort of fixation on it, which is I, I have a, an unfortunate habit of handling very poorly in a way that's sort of, especially when, you know, as I was when I arrived at the convention, I'm not, you know, in the most 
absolutely fantasticest, fantasticest, is that even a word conditioned mentally at the moment, I've been quite anxious and depressed about various things and, you know, I was feeling a bit on edge to begin with. Um, but, you know, it's fairly unbecoming of someone of the relatively advanced age that I at least supposedly on the paper am that, yeah, immediately, as I said, like, we've got to stop this becoming a thing. It became this kind of downward spiral of fail, this anxiety that I was sort of experiencing in response to this person. You know, this sort of almost slapsticky self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like, it's like when you need to go to sleep and so you lie, and you know, it's because you've got to get up early tomorrow and it's really important that you have a good night's sleep. So you're lying there going, I must not be unable to get to sleep. And of course you are. I must not be nervous. I must not be weird around this person. And it, it just got worse and worse. And, the, you know, that was just shitball. I mean, it wasn't a big deal, but it was making me uncomfortable. I think it was also making... Um, Although I couldn't speak for 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 her, I think it was making her uncomfortable as well. And it's just not very good. So I thought, what can we do about this? What can we do to offset this unfortunate tendency? And as it, it became apparent through various sort of people running around whispering in secret meetings, you know, trying to determine who was going to participate in the incursion on the island, that we were both up for it. So I was like, okay, here's what we can do about this. We're going to participate with this person in, you know, a pre-dawn raid and infiltration of one of the most clandestine military facilities in the country. You know, that's just the, that's just the ticket, which is, might sound funny and it was meant to sound funny, but it probably doesn't, <laughs> but, um, it might seem perverse. <laughs> and I did wonder if I was being kind of a bit selfish in, in, in participating in it, given the anxiety that I was experiencing around this person and, you know, and the, the condition I was in generally, whether I was going to jeopardise the mission. Um, but it did seem to be a, a, a sort of way to address that problem because obviously if you do something like that with someone, it has a tendency to cut through the crap because, and put things in perspective, because there's no time for nonsense like that. You've got to just get on with the job and, and you know, and it's going to be a bonding exercise and break the ice somewhat. And it did, in, in fact, I'd like to think, prove to be highly successful in doing that, you know, in, in kind of breaking through that um, anxiety and alienation that I was having. Um, it was a bonding experience, especially since given what eventually happened, which was more fucked up than anyone really anticipated. Um, um, yeah, we yeah. So our team of four had reached the top of the island after three hours and had not been detected. We'd um, gotten into the part where there was sort of buildings and stuff. We saw this enormous shooting range with these big rubber body targets and stuff. And we came to some residences. And at that point we decided to enact the plan that we had agreed on to split up and, um, you know, um, you know, two of us wanted to try and get into a building and, and Moyle was really keen on planting seeds. He loves doing that chamomile, apparently. Chamomile and sunflower chamomile is impossible to get rid of, so he was going to plant some of that. Um, and at this point, just as we decided to split up, but not really split up, um, I was doing something on my phone and looked up and saw this yellow high-vis vest about 15 minutes in front of me and I realised that it was over, we'd been found. Um, and we were then treated to the nicest arrest that I have ever seen. You know, there's absolutely lovely cops who are incredibly um, polite, almost apologetically polite to us, put us in a, in a brawler van. Uh, and as they were putting the four of us, and as they were putting us in the van, they said, you know, you were lucky that we found you. Um, the others didn't get off so easy, some of the people here don't mess around. Um, and uh, we didn't really know what they meant by that. But, uh, have a drink at this point. 
about 10 or 15 minutes after we'd been in the band together, uh, two of the other group, Sam Quinlan and Greg Rolls were, bleh, yeah. Sam Quinlan and Greg Rolls were put in, in the van with us, you know. And uh, the first thing I noticed was that Sam's, something was up with Sam's pants. He was wearing these ill-fitting Ill shorts that didn't seem to be his, holding them up with his hands, you know. And so it's like, well, you know, what's going on? You know, we graded each other. And it's like, what's going on with your pants? I'm sort of reciting the legal statement that I gave now. But, and they were like, oh, well, some soldiers found us. And um, they cut my pants off with a knife. And they, you know, and they came out in bits and pieces. This narrative of what had happened to them, um, you know. And initially, as they were talking about this stuff, you know, they put hessian bags on our heads. Um, you know, they threatened to throw sand in the water. They cut. They were cuffed at their ankles and their wrists. <laughs> cuffed at their wrists and their ankles. Um, and threatened and with various fairly severe things. I thought they were joking, you know, it was, it was this sort of nightmare scenario that we had obviously sort of thought about, but hadn't really seriously considered was gonna be something that would actually happen, um, that we would be found by some rogue off-duty members of the SAS and tortured, you know, of course that's not gonna happen, you know. But you know, it could happen, and it became apparent as they continued to talk about this stuff that they were not joking. Yeah, that they had been um, crash tackled to the ground, and and hog tied, and had hessian bags put in their heads. Welcome to the bag, motherfucker. They said um, their clothes were, were ripped off them or cut off them. Uh, they were beaten. It seems pretty harshly although in a way that has not left a whole lot of physical evidence because of course that's something that these guys are well trained to do you know and it was an interrogation they wanted to know how many people were on the island that's what they kept asking um you know um and it was essentially i mean I was saying earlier, there's not a whole lot of domestic terrorism in Australia, but it's hard to know what you would call an attack like this on unarmed, totally defenceless citizens, you know, who were known to be non-violent peace activists by the people attacking them, you know, for, essentially for political reasons, um, except an act of terrorism. <laughs> But, you know, it was our guys who did it, so, you know, that's okay. Um, and uh, I guess that was something which, you know, having talked a lot about politics and the abstract reasons why I was there and, and sort of stupid personal reasons why I was there and various personal things that were going on, and this sense of that in many ways we had had the wind taken out of our sails by the strategy that the police had used. Um, boom, that tied the whole thing into a fairly sharp focus of, of reality, of the reality of why we were there, of, of what this was really about, you know, bring, bringing that home in a very real way. Um, fairly visceral and immediate way. <laughs> um, you know, that, that these other manner of people, the manner of men and women that, I mean, I don't know if there are actually any women in the SAS that's probably classified. Um, <laughs> these are the manner of people that Swan Island produces your tax dollars at work. You know, these brutal psychopaths, basically. <laughs> Um, you know, and there was this sort of, and, 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 you know, there was a sense in which we brought it on ourselves. We'd sort of poked this thing with a stick and it had bitten back, um, fairly harshly. And it, you know, it could have been pretty, of course, numerous people on social media, keyboard warriors, 
declaring that we deserved it or that, you know, the people who were assaulted deserved it or saying, you know, what did you expect? Um, uh, you know, which has not done a great deal to, to restore my already waning faith in humanity. Um, there was a terrible sense of dislocation. Pilbara wrote a blog post about this, which captures it well, sitting, you know, after we had gone out. You know, we've been arrested, processed, and then thrown out at the gates, sitting in this beautiful um, picture postcard seaside town, surrounded by you know absolutely lovely people, you know, um, who understood what had happened and why. Uh, you know, realizing that, that we were sitting, you know, on the doorstep of this school for, for psychopaths, um, you know, Greg Rolls, who was one of the people who was assaulted, um, reports thinking, you know, as he was there, hogtied, naked, with a bag on his head, being threatened in a way that was pretty convincing and would have been pretty convincing at the time with being raped with a stick if he didn't disclose how many people were on the island. You know, strange things go through your head, things you think in times like this. Um, you know, if this is what these people do on their day off, they were in cities, if this is what they do to people they know are harmless, Australian peace activists, people with access to media, to networks, you know, um, and to the Australian legal system. If this is what they do on their day off, just imagine what they get up to when they're at work, to people they perceive as the enemy, people with no legal recourse, totally off the radar whilst pursuing the US imperialist agenda in some of the most blighted countries on earth. You know, your tax dollars at work. <laughs> Um, yeah, and yes, so the, yeah, yeah, it's, but yeah, it, 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 it's brought the whole thing into, you, you know, cuts through the kind of bullshit of, of, you know, that's, that's what we were there to, to, to sort of bring to light and we did it'd be nice to think you know it's certainly brought it home to me it'd be nice to think that it's brought it home to other people to think about what you know what swan island is what it's for what it does um yeah and it, it had echoes to me i guess you, you, i've thought a lot about it um it, it, uh, other actions I've done specifically, I mentioned Brizo at the start, Kurt Brizo called me in the morning and has, <laughs> um, who's currently in exile in Kathmandu. The 10 monster incident, the notorious Occupy Melbourne 10 monster incident of late 2011, which was the last time that a friend of mine had been forcibly stripped with knives by dehumanised drones. And I remember a lot of us at the time obviously being pretty horrified that this had occurred. I mean, again, it could have been predicted that this would occur. It was sort of like, what did you expect? But we didn't really seriously actually think that that was going to happen, but it did happen. And obviously there's a part of you that's sort of horrified um, and deeply upset. And there's another, there's this sort of doppelhertz thing that you do where you sort of go, well, yes, but was it a good action? Was it, you know, what did it make the point? Did we, whatever these people did, however terrible that was, did they reveal themselves, you know, in a way that brought to light what <laughs> we were seeking to bring to light? And the answer is yes, you know, it was a good action in that regard. Um, And that's kind of the end. That's all that I had to say, really. I, I'm acutely conscious that <laughs> in doing something like this, you've got to have a good parting shot. You've got to, you know, and I'd like to to wind it up. Actually, on a positive note, I'm, you know, I, I'm talked out at this point and just even thinking about this stuff is, is kind of run me a bit ragged. 
um, you know, is, is there a punchline? And the thing I had to come back to is the, yeah, the extreme contrast, Erin, who is a sort of resident legal person, um, at the convergence was talking about the, it being a week of extreme contrasts, which is true. Um, and what she meant by that is just the, the contrast between the brutality that had been um, practiced or, de you know, delivered by these people. Um, and I use the term loosely uh, against some of us on this island. Um, and, and, and the community of, of the Peace Convergence, who were sort of, in so many ways, kind of the antithesis of that. Um, you know, just lovely people. And, and that was an enormously, you, you know, added, I'm not expressing this well, I wish that I could, I wish that I could put it into a, you know, um, there was a, we did a closing thing at the end of this day, which had been a pretty long shattering day, you know, but a closing ceremony to mark the end of the three day blockade at the base, um, and balloons, we released balloons, uh, biodegradable <laughs> balloons that would not harm local wildlife, um, red ones symbolizing blood and, um, white ones symbolising peace, one of which got caught on the gate, and blue ones symbolising the blue sky, which is the thing that, you know, in the words of the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, who are a group in Afghanistan who are sort of have a s strong connection with, with the Peace Convergence mob, um, we all live under the same blue sky. Um, I'm seeing Nicola Paris, you know, who's a fairly hard-bitten character, you know, she's a bit of a legend, um, you know, who's been heavily involved in a lot of campaigns around social justice and environmental justice with a particular focus on, on pretty hardcore direct action, um, who'd been pretty wrung out by this thing, um, crying, <laughs> um, and, I, you know, I felt... I can't say what she was feeling, but I, I, you know, there was this sense that it, she wasn't just crying because it was sad what had happened or that it was traumatic, but because it was inspiring to see um, these people who had sort of put themselves in the way of this and the community around them. Um, I'm, I wish I, you know, I'm not doing a good job of this and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but... Yeah, there is a, you know, the positive note that comes out of that is, is that it, it restores my faith in, in people, which is, yeah, you know, been tested a lot over the last little while in various ways and was certainly tested by this incident. But, you know, the, this thing, of it's, it's better to light a candle, you know, and shed some light into the world than curse the darkness. Um... <clears throat> yeah, and I feel I feel very privileged and sort of humbled to be a part of this group, you know, who are, who are very actively committed and very like and very practically committed to doing that, or at least trying to do that, you know, and, and somewhat successfully doing that in in a world that can be pretty dark. I think that that's a good thing to do. Um, yeah, I, that's all I got really. I think that's all. Um, in the unlikely event that anyone has actually watched this to the end, if you have been, thank you. Good evening. <laughs>